I was so fortunate that I got the chance to work with Carlos Slaber. He he was asked sort of uh, of chance like that to do the Rosen Cavalier at the Met. Uh, because uh, they ask him every now and again, Carlos, would you like to come and do something? And if he's, if he by chance would say yes, then you know he can do anything he likes, as far as I know. And he said, yes, I might want to come and do the Rosen Cavalier, who's singing. And it was Felicity Lott, Barbara Bonney, and myself. And uh, this was good enough for him. And uh, we were all shaking like leaves. One of my best ever memories, career highlights, whatever you want to call it, was the, uh, the Vienna Rosenkavalier with Anne-Sophie and Barbara Bonny and Carlos Kleiber, who called us his, his touring trio. Um, we, went, we also sang together in New York and in Tokyo, and it was a, an absolute dream. I love singing with Anne-Sophie. She has the most glorious, creamy, round, beautiful voice. She's a beautiful woman. She's taller than me, <laughs> which is actually great because uh, it's hard to find an Octavian who's taller than me. Stockholm is the city of my dreams. I find this an extraordinary, beautiful place and I love living in Stockholm. I was born here and we moved when I was four and spent two years in Germany and then I was in for five years in London and then I moved back to Sweden to go to a boarding school. My father was a diplomat, this is the reason why we moved around. But since the age of 18, I've lived again in Stockholm and I just adore Stockholm, I think. So all the water and the reasonably clean air and the, the pretty houses and nearness to the countryside is perfect. I don't want to live anywhere else. I often get asked whether I see myself as a primarily a, a, a singer of leader or if I'm an opera singer, but I see myself, I see myself as a musician, first of all, and a singer, secondly. Singing is my instrument. I like to go from leader to a, a fully staged production of an opera with an interesting um, director and hopefully a good conductor. And then I love the orchestral repertoire, the Marla Cycles, uh, Les Nuits d'été, uh, Sherazade. Uh, so uh, I don't think that I have a particular favorite within, within these genres. It's more a question that I love it all and uh, going from one to the other keeps me on my toes. school at 18, I, uh, I didn't go straight to music school, I played the piano and, uh, and then nothing else. And you had to play a second instrument, you had to do a lot of things to get into this, uh, to get into the academy. I started singing choirs here in Stockholm, I was in every good choir there is. In the Bach choir, in the radio choir, in the chamber choir, in the, in the cathedral choir. I sang five five nights a week, and then there were the concerts at the weekends, and I got a, such a kick out of out of that the whole social bit of singing in a choir. And I went to university and just got the points uh, that you uh, are meant to get, but uh, I don't remember any of it, unfortunately. Very little stuck stuck in in my brain. And then the and the second year after school, I worked in a. Um, small record firm where I made the coffee, I, I licked the stamps and, um, and things like that, answered the phone and I kept uh, taking my lessons. I played the, started playing the flute and I kept, took singing lessons etc etc and then the, and then the third year 
I made it into music college. My parents were the kind of parents who thought that it's very good to have a thorough, all-encompassing uh, education, which is why I uh, started this class and for, went all the, did all the four years, which a lot of people skipped the last year because that's the year where you had to go out into the schools and actually stand in front of the kids, which it was again something terrifying. Me and I was hopeless. I was not good as a music teacher. But that's how I got my schooling. At the Academy of Music here in Stockholm, I attended the music teachers class, which is a four year course. And at that time, it was still in the old days, and you learned thoroughly, you know, different instruments a string instrument or a wind instrument, plus piano, plus singing, plus orchestral conducting, plus choir conducting and all the theory uh, subjects as well. And Erik Eriksson was the teacher of this, uh, this class, uh, which was wonderful because he was number one in Sweden. And uh, yes, we had to get up and practice uh, in front of the rest of the class, uh, which was terrifying as well. Dels ska ni ha örona på helspänn och höra vad, vad, vad händer nu och vad är det? Så det är verkligen förlåtligt om det inte händer på en gång. Men det är bara att träna. Nu tar vi igen. Ditt i liv. There were some important decisions that I made. First of all, going abroad, going to London to the Guildhall School of Music and Drama after my six years at Music College in Stockholm was a good thing for me to do, to go outside of Sweden and, and see, you know, compare myself to other singers and and uh, s switched me, uh, singing teacher obviously, I went to Vera Roja who taught me an enormous amount and who had a wonderful feeling for what kind of repertoire I should be singing. The truth, but only depending to whom, how much. Beglücke. Beglücke. Mål. Beglücke. Mål. Beglücke. Be. Before I came to Vera Roja, I had didn't have a top to my voice, and I didn't know which repertoire to sing. I. The only opera arias I'd sung were the low ones because I uh, I hated singing at the, the, using the top range of my voice, and you know I hadn't been in her in her study for more than ten minutes before she said that I should be doing Cherubino, I should be doing later on Rosencavalier, and uh, that I should do a lot of Lieder and that I should do the Mahler, the orchestral repertoire. So she was very clear-eyed and helped me a lot with with. With, the, with my range and with the colors in my voice and, and you must not be do boring darling people you, you have a nice voice but uh, you know you have to uh, show your personality and she, she's a very uh, tough lady so I, I did go through some you know um, lessons where I was not um, laughing but on the contrary crying <laughs> but she's, she's also very warm and if she really cares for you she, she'll do anything to help you. Yeah, exactly the same. But when you when you speak, you don't do this. Listen, beglücke, beglücke, this down in beglücke, 
Okay. Much longer. And then the second th good thing that happened was that I went to Basel because Basel was a fantastic place for me to start in Switzerland where they, uh, they I did, uh, you know, they, they work very thoroughly, six weeks of preparation and you don't have to do a lot of things at the same time. My lucky break then came uh, thanks to Colin Davis who gave me, I auditioned for Carabino to sing Carabino in a production of Figaro uh, at Covent Garden and he, I auditioned to him and he worked a little bit with me and, and so I got the part and that was my big breakthrough because the, the critics were very kind and it was a very good role for me to break through with. The first thing I ever did on stage um, properly as a singing actress was down in Wodsty and I, it was run by Arnold Östman and he asked me to do this role of a sort of a servant um, and it was my first experience on stage and I was scared to death but uh, once we got the uh, performances rolling I enjoyed myself very much. The person I'm working with today is called David Harper and he comes from New Zealand but has lived in, in London for a long, long time. I've known him for a while. He, uh, I think we first worked together when he was playing the cembalo, the harpsichord, in a production of Cosi that I did. And he's become a good friend and he comes here every now and again, works with me and, and other singers also. And he has helped me a lot with uh, different things in my voice and he's a great enthusiast. I mean, he really, he, he loves his profession as much as I do mine. He, he adores teaching and, uh, and I find that I uh, get very good results. <laughs> Sneaking up from behind. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right, so all we need now is Bengt with the keys. Uh -huh. okay. Hello. Hello, hello. Hi. Hi. Good to see you again. Yes. It's been a long time. <laughs> it's a long time, really. <laughs> That's when we look good. Oh. Yeah, it's good this night. It was? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Feels a bit fat. In what way? Well, the way you always say it sounds <laughs> fat. <laughs> fat or flat? Ooh, fat. Oh, fat. Hmm. But it sounded okay, did it? Yeah, it did. But yeah, I just think it is, is that onto thing to get it back onto you. It's not the right place to sing a tone like that. It's no. too small a room. Exactly. But, um, no, I mean, I thought that was pretty good actually. All professional singers need to um, maintain their vocal form and um, they're running around doing lots and lots of performances everywhere so uh, they don't have anybody uh, to, uh, to tell them when they're sort of going off track etc so I think that's why um, people like Anne Sophie um, use somebody like me to uh, just keep the edges rounded off, etc., and talk about some vocal sort of things because, you know, there's a certain amount of wear and tear that goes on in the, uh, you know, uh, when you're doing high-level performance. <laughs> and, um, and so we work on details and technical uh, balancing, rebalancing, you know, the voice is constantly developing all the time, so we have to work out how to sort of blend the registers, things like that, and uh, details of um, articulation of certain languages.
I think there's, so there's finding out exactly when you're keep, keeping the vibrato going, and then you can just glide through the through the t text and you know not to try and keep too much vibration going. Mm -hmm. I think that's the important thing there. Is that what you were talking about? Does it about? sound all right to you this time? I did. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because now yeah. I was very busy doing the the zing uh -huh. and not paying any attention to the, the consonants really. Uh huh. As most singers, particularly mezzos, it, the, the top register is always the, um, the, the not problem area so much as, uh, as the, um, the area that you have to be very, very careful of. I mean, it's one thing to just slam your voice into the top register, but it's another thing to really keep it on the support, keep the throat open. Things like that we talk about all the time. And because Ansofie does such an incredibly wide variety of repertoire, um, some of it's much lower placed in the middle of the voice and some of it's higher, like Rosenkavalier we've just been working on, that's quite a high tessitura. <laughs> yeah. But you don't want to be, keep the chest voice all the way, no, 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 but, but no. The, the, the openness. But I mean, but you, did, did, you, did you think you were in the right chest voice on Ryan, eh? Yes. Really? Or a mix. Yeah. <laughs> People always ask me why I've sung such a lot of trouser rolls. Well, I, I always say it goes with the voice. If you have a lyric mezzo, the kind of voice that I have, then you automatically sing uh, the trouser rolls because they are written for, for either Castrati in the days gone by, or in the case of Richard Strauss, he, he wanted a, a soprano or a mezzo to do his Rosenkavalier, his composer, uh, and then, of course, the Mozart rolls and the, the Handel. I was com particularly comfortable with this repertoire when I started out because I, I felt, um, I don't know, I, I was, I was happier doing doing my trouser rolls. Young, young sort of men who were st stood and. Uh, in a corner, more than more than having to be grabbed by a tenor. Uh, when I did uh, Dorabella, I felt so. I didn't feel too good about doing Dorabella, even though I did Dorabella quite a lot and with some success. I uh, always was happy go, to go back into my trousers. Now, uh, when I've been in the business for a while and had experience and feel better being on stage, I. Uh, I would love to do more female roles, uh, but there aren't that many for my type of voice. My voice hasn't changed that much. I started looking at uh, Alceste and uh, and uh, oh, it's such a gorgeous piece of music with lots and lots of arias <laughs> and, and it was to become a real um, challenge for me and I think I learned a lot from it. I enjoyed working with Robert Wilson a lot.
vill säga att, att eh, våra yrken är sådana att jag älskar mitt yrke väldigt mycket och Ansvi gör det. Och planerar man livet så kan man säga att ja, så här är vårt liv. Så att vi inte tror att vi ska behöva jämföra våra liv med andras liv därför att där man ska ha ett 9-5 jobb. Utan vi, våra liv är väldigt ryckigt. Vi jobbar mycket ibland och sen är vi lediga väldigt mycket periodvis. Och det gör att ja, det fungerar väldigt bra tycker jag. I sing concerts quite regularly at the, with the radio orchestra, with the Philharmonic. And I also prepare my leader repertoire with Bengt Forsberg here in Stockholm. So uh, we work every day and occasionally we do a sort of warm-up concert in the little church uh, where he has his chamber music series. But the last time I sang at the Stockholm Opera was in 98, uh, a new piece called Staden, the city to commemorate the cultural capital of uh, Europe. Stockholm was the cultural capital of Europe in 1998. The libretto was vaguely about feelings between people and outsiders and how people don't communicate well. The role that I played I found fascinating because it was more like a creature. It wasn't an uh, androgynous uh, figure, it was more a creature, more like an animal to me. I first met uh, Anne-Sophie, uh, I think, about 20 years ago. She was looking for a pianist, uh, mainly to, to go through new repertoire, and she needed somebody who was fast enough, I mean, sight reader, good sight reader, and I am, and we, quite uh, soon, we felt that it's really something to work on. That was 20 years ago. And still uh, is as wonderful, I have to say, it's no routine yet, after 20 years. Just doing one kind of repertoire sort of bores me to tears after a while, so I love going from, from leader to to opera, to the orchestral repertoire, and back again, and changing the composers. The repertoire that I do with Bengt Forsberg, we change all the time. We don't stick to two or three or four composers or, or two programs. We are always learning new things, and uh, we're very hungry musicians, both of us. It took me almost 20 years to understand that uh, this, uh, the, 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 the art of song itself, that, that's a genre that, in, in this case, Anne-Sophie has her perhaps only chance to be the interpreter herself, to, to decide herself exactly how she wanted, wants it to be. And I've always objected to that, of course. I wanted to, I mean, this is a chamber music. We, have a, we, we are a wonderful couple. We prefer, prepare ourselves so much, and, and that gives the result on, I think, wonderful concerts and, and, and recordings, and we share the work. But I understand uh, now that she really wants to do it her, her way, and why not? I mean, I can play my sonatas by Beethoven, Schubert, Schumann, everything on my own, and create. I have this wonderful repertoire of a solo piano and chamber music. So why not let her have this? That took me 20 years to understand.
This farm, it's a small farm, has belonged to my family since 1945, when my father bought it to have somewhere to go in Sweden for holidays. He wanted his children to be in the country during summer holidays, and I think he had a, an idea of being sort of a gentleman farmer somehow. So in the beginning there was a farmer here with ten cows and two pigs and an old horse and you know like a small nice farm with chickens and we I was the one who went down every day to get the milk the five liters of milk in the little bucket and I was allowed to help brush the cows I love the cows It's easy in this business to only think about how am I feeling today, how's the voice and did I get enough applause yesterday and why don't I have anything in this period in three years' time. It's empty, nobody's asked me, I'm not wanted anymore. <laughs> and I mean, I have all those thoughts myself, but at least uh, I don't have them as much as I would if I didn't have a family. Now I can bother about my children, how they are, if they need to go to the doctor or do the homework. and. Uh, I enjoy all that, as long as I don't have to do it 365 days per year. Now I can go away and have my little sort of holiday, working holiday in the hotel room. My brother now keeps sheep so that we don't get trees all over the place because, you know, you leave the, the land alone for five years and you have trees sticking out everywhere. This is my sister's house. And these are the trees that my brother cut down and is now going to sell the logs. And these are the beautiful Swedish birch trees. These are the stones that I like so much, the Swedish grey stone, gråsten which to me is very much at home because we have a lot of stone here in Roslagen, as this area is called. Lots and lots and lots of it. Look at all this. It's always been lying there. It's not been put there by, by my sister, so, you know, to make her look interesting. No, the stones have always been there since the Ice Age. I hate nettle, nettles and uh, thistles. So I spent a couple of days this summer digging up uh, this horrible stuff because I like to walk barefoot and it hurts your feet. This used to be auntie's house, now it is nephew's house. And the house over there is where I grew up. That's the old house. Like you see the top of the, the old house where, where we all lived when we were all living together, the four children and the, the mother and the father. And then little by little, all, everyone built their own little house. So now we don't live together anymore. We come here as often as we can, and my two brothers and my sister and their children, grown-up children and their grandchildren, they all come out here and, you know, we celebrate Easter together or midsummer, and we go swimming in the lake and we go crayfish fishing and berry picking and mushroom picking. And it's very relaxing to be out here. Ja, frågan är, börjar du med potatis? Jag börjar med potatis. En. Två. These houses have stood here for... The older one is from 89. 89. And the newer one is from 94. Yes. And I met Benny in 1987. You came out here, it was through Bengt Forsberg, the eternal <laughs> Bengt Forsberg and his wife, who knew of you and, uh, and you were invited out here on a sort of blind date. Uh, on <laughs> Walpurgisnacht, 1987. It was a very nice, warm 30th of April and uh, that's when we met for the first time. We did the uh, handle pastiche at Drottingholm uh, six, seven years ago with Barbara Bonney. 94. We, 94. We took the, uh, some of Handel's choicest arias and duets 
and then there was some incidental music with four guys, four nice looking boys jumping around on stage in the sort of modern choreography. And Rein Reinhard Goebel was conducting with his wig, sort of sitting sideways <laughs> on his head. And uh, it was wonderful, it worked really well. It was for sure Bengt Forspey who introduced me to Korngold, <laughs> as uh, he was always a huge Korngold fan. I think he discovered Korngold really early on and completely fell in love with him. As much as you can fall in love with the composer, Bengt Forspey fell in love with uh, Erich Wolfgang Korngold. And he, he, and he was always saying, listen to this, listen to this, and he would play bits of uh, Die Tote Stadt, but uh, Marietta's lead is too high for me, actually, the way it is uh, in the opera. But when we did our Korngold recording with chamber music pieces and songs, then Bengt sat down, which he rarely does, uh, and, and arranged the aria and he put, took it down one tone, so it was comfortable for me, and he really did a wonderful job. Sounds great. It's a pity Elvis Costello was never out here. Uh, it all started when he and his wife came to lots of concerts where I sang in London. He came to recitals and orchestral concerts. And, and he, he hadn't been a lot to classical concerts, but he saw that people were always given flowers, which they never, they never give each other flowers in the pop business. <laughs> and so he, he said to his wife, you know, you, feel you want to thank the singer and what, what can we do? And, and they said, well, why don't we give them flowers like everyone else seems to? So I was presented with these beautiful, exquisite bouquets of flowers. <laughs> and first, I think he only said Elvis Costello. So I thought, I thought, whoops. <laughs> but then it, it wasn't only Elvis Costello, it was his wife as well. They were really, both of them, genuinely interested in classical music. And then we started talking, and then we did this concert in Stockholm, and he wrote some songs for the Brodsky Quartet and myself. And we did in on a tour. And then I finally asked him uh, whether he would uh, fancy being producer of this so-called crossover disc, a term that he hates, but I use it anyway. These, these songs remind me vaguely of the things that I do normally, the, the leader repertoire. It's like chamber music dash pop. 
Which is your favorite on the Costello disc? I think it's Ben Anderson yes. for me. In fact, I enjoy recording very much. I'm a bit strange. I go into the recording studio and feel like a racehorse, and and I really, you know, it's a great kick for me, a, a rush of adrenaline when I record. I love almost everything French anyway, the, the French repertoire that I sing. It's always a pleasure to, to sing, and uh, Sherazade in particular, I find the texts very, uh, sensual and uh, always loved Sherazad. The orchestration is wonderful. I wish I could do it more often. People often ask me, you know, when I sing Trouser Rolls and I get to uh, verbally make love to a woman like in, uh, in the Cherubino or Octavia and they're all so uh, in love with the women around them and, and um, you know, wanting to jump into bed with them, but uh, I don't know, I mean, uh, <laughs> For me, it's not a big deal. I just uh, t t use the experiences I have as a woman and, um, and use them in the music or, or in the d dramatic context. And I don't, for me, it's not a big deal and it never has been. And there are people who like to turn this into all kind of Freudian things and lesbian things. And for me, it's, uh, it's just, uh, it's, it's normal. <laughs> Carlos Kleiber called us his dream team and, and in fact I mean we did work extremely well. Our voices blended well and as types we worked very well together. Uh, but the fact that the, 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 the staging worked so well uh, I think um, you have to thank the, the, the assistant for and Otto Schenk for and and of course, we were hugely inspired by having by having Kleiber in in the pit. You don't uh, you don't uh, sort of slop around stage. You do your best all the time because you want to please this man. She is so so very talented. She is uh, extremely musical for being a singer. <laughs> I was about to say <laughs> that. Well, she is um, she has a wonderful ear, and she can grasp uh, structures of music. When, when I wait, is that too much silence, or do you want me to just hold the pedal on a little bit more, or just come off with you?
On this tour, I asked Melbourne to play the Hammer Clavier because I love the colours of the Hammer Clavier. I think you get much more colours that suit these particular songs, a range of colours, a particularly wooden, lovely flavour that you don't get on the modern piano. The modern piano has other qualities. It's more consistent. It doesn't sort of go out of tune in the middle of the concert or the pedal doesn't get stuck. But I find it very touching and uh, I really, really go for the colours. So um, that's why we use the forte piano on the two recordings that we've done uh, of Mozart Haydn and now Beethoven and Maya Beerspohr. I like singing with the sound. I mean, it doesn't never, I don't need to force my voice at all. The, the, the modern grand can become quite heavy sometimes. And Melvin plays this instrument very beautifully. Are we doing all of, we're doing all of me now? No, so, I'm afraid this is a Singing leader has taught me to use my creativity and not be shy about it because I can do endless things to uh, to amuse, keep me amused. I mean, I sound uh, it sounds very academic, but uh, it's first of all a question about making music in a way that is satisfying to me. I think opera is a very different thing. In opera, you have to step back a little bit from being so madly musically creative and, and more go into the production, see how you work on stage and uh, and as I say, I, I adore working with a director who really has something to say and and, uh, and then it's more a question of, of uh, things like that.
She's like a chameleon. She can change. I've heard her sing with Elvis Costello. I've heard her sing Baroque. I've heard her sing classical with me. I've heard her sing Congo with Banked. And every time I hear her, although you know immediately it's Aunt Sophie, because it, with singers you can tell immediately the voice, who it is. And as personally somebody as special as Aunt Sophie. But the way she uses the voice, I think, is incredibly clever because she's got this vast array of a palette of colors, you know, but she doesn't always use everything. So she's very clever what she uses. And when you hear her do a Handel opera, she uses certain things which are very stylistic and very good. But when she sings with Elvis Costello, then she sort of, you know, swings it. And, uh, and it's, it's great because not many singers can do that. I can't go from Baroque to Rosencavalier like that because I need to change the, what I do muscularly and, and everything. It's all very bewusst. So for me, I don't want to be away from home more than um, a week at a time if I can help it because I have my family. So I'll go off the day, the day before I have a concert so that I wake up in the city where the concert is taking place, hopefully in a nice hotel so I sleep well and feel good. And then I do my concert and then we go on to the next place, maybe have a day in between because singing every other day is already on the borderline for what my voice uh, is happy doing and then another concert and possibly the same thing again and then I go home. So uh, in that way I'm happy and my family is happy and my voice is happy. I think the voice of Anne-Sophie is exactly ideal for, for most of Offenbach music because it's written for central women voices with great uh, declamation, um, talent and instinct and um, some things are very funny, some things are very poetic, some things are middle character. You can find a lot of contrasts.